order the September 25th uh, meeting of the Deschutes County Board of Commissioners. Uh, we please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So the first item on our agenda is the citizen input. Um, if you uh, want to speak on a topic, we have you fill out the a blue form down there. Um, I've got one here. If uh, anybody else wants to speak, uh, you can fill that out or we can fill it out afterwards. But uh, Rondo, a.k.a. Ron Bozell. Okay. And the a.k.a. was he supplied. <laughs> A lot of us already know who I am. It's, uh, I'm an activist in Bend, Oregon. I've been living here as a resident for uh, almost 30 years. Uh, some also know me as a political candidate sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> today I want to talk about something that somebody told me yesterday. Uh, I was surprised they said it to me. They said, there are no homeless <laughs> solutions. You can't solve homelessness. And I say, no, that's not true. It's only true if you believe it. It's also true if you believe the opposite. Today, uh, I'm not sure under the direct supervision or not, I'm sure that you're aware that on Century uh, Drive, just past six mile marker uh, near Widgee Creek Golf Course, uh, they're shutting down. I believe it's the U.S. Forest Service, but I, I don't know. So I'm here uh, bringing a little bit of my ignorance with me. Um, they're shutting that down. Um, thing is, uh, by coincidence, uh, a friend of mine asked me to stay out uh, there last week, and I stayed a night. And I saw a friend help another friend, uh, a couple friends, move out. And they proceeded to leave a few weeks' worth of trash. So uh, now I get to put that in the column of things I've actually seen happen, because I've read, read a lot of things. If I can recount quickly a conversation I had with a sheriff when I was in jail last year uh, during my campaign season for city council. Um, uh, he always chose me for his work parties, and he would ask me a lot of questions about issues uh, that he necessarily were, was curious about, and we got talking about homelessness, and now I noticed that our jail is full of homeless people, if you haven't noticed yet. Um, and I mean like 98%. Uh, so uh, he told me his accounts of some of the cleanups that he's been involved with. And so I asked him, I said, are you on a county, county advisory board? Because I think your experience is valuable. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to have the solutions. I do, but uh, for the moment, uh, we need people like this in a conversation, and I'd like to ask you to consider creating a, 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 a citizens' advisory board on homeless solutions, because there are her solutions. It's just that here's my political theory: everything you see in the man-made world is there because somebody is invested in it. We have homelessness in, in Deschutes County because there are interests invested in homelessness. So I suggest uh, that this year we solve the homelessness issues in our county. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to keep talking about it louder and louder and louder. And I will be doing so as a Deschutes County Councilor to be commission candidate. Thank you. Thank you. So anyone else that uh, wants to speak on any other topic that's not on the agenda for today? Move on to our consent agenda. Um, any, I had some changes on the uh, minutes, so that's the only thing I wanted to pull for April or for September 18th. Oh, you want to pull that? Yeah. That's fine with that. Uh, here we have an add on uh, updated agenda from yesterday, but uh, with that, I'll move approval minus item number six uh, minutes from September 18th. And I'll second it. Okay. Uh, further discussion? Commissioner DeBone? Yes. Commissioner Dare? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So we'll pre proceed to our action agenda. Um, first item is a consideration of board signature resolution 2019-044. Sending the fire instructions. 
Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Ed Keith, County Forester. Uh, before you today, you do have uh, Resolution 2019-044, uh, proposing to rescind fire restrictions. Uh, you may recall when you enacted these restrictions in July, uh, we typically, uh, based on average weather patterns, uh, extend those out until mid-October. They were set to sunset on October 15th automatically. However, we have had a uh, I'd, I'd say extremely wet September in comparison to normal Septembers. Um, it even looks like we might uh, be getting some snow over the coming weekend. So uh, it's been it's been uh, an interesting and and very quiet and safe fire season. Um, looking at stats for uh, the the state, uh, acres burned are down quite a bit. Um, it looks like year to date acreage for all ownerships is. Just under 68,000 acres burned uh, this year, or last year at this time, we were at uh, over 883,000 acres. Um, uh, current expenditures were somewhere in the neighborhood of 58 million. Last year, they were 530 million in uh, suppression expenditures. So, fairly quiet year. Um, it has a lot to do with the moisture that we've received with our with our rain, but we did have quite a lot of fire starts. Um, and uh, luckily there were the resources available to really effectively suppress those fires. So just a little summary for you of looking back through the fire season, but uh, those conditions have moderated quite a bit with our rainfall. Uh, last week, the Oregon Department of Forestry removed their restrictions that correspond with, uh, and ours, ours look uh, very similar to theirs, but ours apply to the unprotected lands in Deschutes County lands where Oregon Department of Forestry is applied to their um, fire protection district. So. Uh, with those considerations, I would propose that we rescind these uh, restrictions early. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> so, uh, a couple comments. I, I saw the the report last night on the news that um, had those statistics you quoted. So that's a tenth, less than a tenth as much acreage, and about a tenth as much money. Um, and uh, that's just amazing. He it says it's the the lowest amount of fire since 2004, so 15 years. Um, I think that rainfall locally is almost 50% more than normal, is what I track in the paper, at the Bend Airport anyway. So, And I think the desert's full of, I was out there the other day and um, at the state lands and all the stuff that grew up is there and dry. So if we'd had dry, a dry August or September, we might have a different but it's just kept raining, hasn't it? Yes, absolutely. And uh, like I say, when we did have a f some of those fires start, we had you know a couple uh, extensive lightning storms, but they did come with rain for one thing, and the other was that uh, when we've typically had you know 20,000 people deployed on wildland fires, those were all resources that were available for you know quick and effective initial attack. And so when the, when we did have those fires, they were suppressed fairly quickly. Questions? Well, I can have uh, a confirm uh, green fields all across the state. I drove to John Day and then north to Baker yesterday, and uh, you know just those fields that are, haven't been irrigated late in the summer. They're all bright green right now. You know, just the farmers' fields. So interesting, interesting, yeah. different dynamic for sure. Uh, I think uh, there's fire restrictions or uh, a kind of burning fire district burning discussion date also coming up. That, that is, so yeah, and this, uh, I would definitely urge anybody uh, that's um, aware that this is lifting, that this does not just allow open burning. This is just like, you know, the more uh, restrictions as far as uh, this would not even allow like campfires, off-road driving, um, blasting, welding, those sorts of things. But, uh, but burning is still um, restricted. It's being talked about being lifted uh, as of October 1st. I believe we're still on track for that assuming that this kind of next cold front comes through and gives us a little bit more moisture. But I would encourage people, if they're thinking of burning, to call their local fire district to make sure it's a burn day. Just so that's a different decision. Qualify that. Your backyard cleanup is. fire is not what we're talking about here. Correct. Great. Questions? Um, I, don't want to, I just want to comment that we were really lucky this year with the numbers being significantly, you know, 10% of prior year and going back to 2004. But um, I do think it is a perfect example of when, why we should expand our fire-free day next spring. Um, you know, we're looking for costs. What would that cost the county to add another day or two at not for free fire day? Um, I just think that it's 
because of the rain. We're going to have more growth, more cleanup necessary, <coughs> and you know it's a win-win for the county and for our residents. So I would hope that even though we only spent what is it, uh, 58 million this year, that the county could pick up and we could expand Fire Free Day. Sure. Yeah. One quiet year doesn't mean that. Uh, mm -hmm. Our, our, you know, more intense fire seasons are behind us. It's nice to have those years, but uh, it, it's definitely a, you know, a, a lower point in in what, uh, you know, I'd expect to be a busier, busier years in the future. Yeah, it's you know, to me, it's interesting that. Um, well, what do you expect going forward? So you go ten times as much fire one year from another. It's actually more than that. It's like twelve times more. Um, but I, other parts of the country had bad, like Alaska apparently had a really bad year. And I don't know what the rest of the country looks like, but. Um. Yeah, the, 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 the rest of the country had, uh, uh, you know, relatively quiet year. Alaska was, uh, was very busy and extended. Uh, they, they typically have a high percentage of the acres burned uh, across the country. But this year that their fire season extended, uh, you know, where it usually cuts off in mid-July, maybe it extended through August yeah. uh, with, you know, just a several pages long list of fires that were burning up there. So, um, so yeah, you know, we definitely see, you know, variability from, from year to year. Okay. Okay, well, support us. And one other note, I guess, uh, here comes the prescribed burn smoke, which yes. we, you know, I do celebrate and I advocate for. So if there's two days of a controlled burn in the near future, uh, that's going to be different than that uncontrolled wildfire that we were just referring to. Uh, so, uh, yeah, 40 acres at a time or whatever the numbers are, uh, you know, let's celebrate the fact that some of that fuel reduction and uh, wildland urban interface is being managed. And I think there's announcements of today and tomorrow possibly around some areas. Correct, yeah. Uh, there's a couple on the Deschutes National Forest burning um, uh, south and east of Lapine um, and uh, those those will be as um, fuels come into prescription and the appropriate uh, wind carries smoke away from populated areas will be ongoing through through the fall yep. and it seems like you're able to do more this year than in the past years but that is that true or am I just imagining that from uh, just the news reports yeah there the, uh, Oregon Department of Forestry had a news release yesterday about the, you know the new uh, smoke management rules that do allow for some tolerance of smoke into populated areas so still uh, complying with the uh, national uh, air standards air quality standards but uh, instead of the zero tolerance policy of no smoke in populated areas there's a um, there's a little bit more tolerance for that with the realization that that's one tool to help reduce fuels in and around communities and it's very difficult to have a you know no smoke policy uh, but but have we stepped up or not we but the forest service or uh, department of forestry is there more prescribed burns going on this year than there were last or well we'll we'll see it's still early in the season um but there's uh, the the weather forecast and permitting process through the Oregon Department of Forestry that allows for those is more tolerant. So if the fuels are in prescription, um, there's going to be potentially more, you know, a few more days. Uh, I think ODF in their news release forecasted, you know, there might be 10 to 20 percent more acres burned across, you know, on a statewide basis. But that's, it, it, it's all always, uh, in addition to the smoke, just weather dependent. So if the fuels are too wet or too dry, uh, it's still, you know, we're still we're still at the whims of Mother Nature a little bit. So, okay. I'll seek a motion. I, I move we have board signature of resolution number two zero one nine dash zero four four, rescinding the fire restrictions for unprotected and Deschutes County owned lands. And I'll second it. Um, further discussion. Commissioner Dare. Yes. Commissioner DeBone? Yes. Chair votes yes. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Ed. So next, we'll have a consideration a board signature on document number 2019-699. Good morning, Commissioners. For the record, Izzy Liu, Associate Planner, Deschutes County Planning Division. Um, earlier this morning, I passed out copies of the board decision. Um, the initial draft was written by the prevailing attorney. Staff made some com or edits, and 
the version in front of you is the final version. Okay. So there was one in the packet, and a f is there slight differences between? No, that? those are the same yeah. ones. I just provided an extra. Okay. So, um, kind of getting right to it uh, in terms of the wording. <clears throat> I don't necessarily object to anything. I, I think it summarizes um, what I understood our decision on the Youth Activity Center. The only thing that concerns me is that um, the emphasis on regular basis being the magic words in this, uh, quoted from Wave Seer that the activities inherent uh, place where activities center around youth on a regular basis. I, th I see regularity as one of the criteria, but I also see the the amount of use. As w and I don't know that I want to change it. I'm just bringing it up for discussion. But regularity would be one thing that we would lead to that classification as a youth activity center, from my mind, was a factor, particularly in wave seer, because it was this one, the amount of use is also a, f a factor to me, that it's not, um, you know, there's a couple that I've, ruled where they just said we have some activities, you know, kids, friends of our, our kids come by and do 4-H stuff. That wasn't, didn't really make, meet the standard for me. But, the, but with this pool, it's not just the regularity of use, but it's also the amount when they use it. It seemed like it was a lot of people sometimes. And so I don't know if we want to include that as a factor. It just, as we if we get challenged in any of these decisions, I want to make sure that Luba or whoever knows the kind of the breadth of what we call a youth activity center. We've denied the licensing part or the you know private business part or all these things as being the factor. But so I don't know what your thoughts are about. Do you know what I'm saying, Commissioner Dare? The, the I do differences know what you're yeah. on a regular basis. I mean, there was extensive youth activities everywhere in the property and it actually, um, you know, the pool area is in the center of the property in question. So, um, yeah, I can I can agree with what you're saying that it's. Do you think we should note that as a, f like one of the factors or one of the um, ways we get to, the, if we agree on that, should we note it as a part of the decision? I guess is my question. Where's our legal counsel? Where's Adam this morning? Is he, he's not here? Uh, he's not with us, but um, there's a section in the decision that lists out the variety of activities. We right. can certainly I like that. include something in there that uh, focuses on. But more goes to me to the pool part of it. That, In other words, if this was a pool that somebody just had in their backyard and they had their friends over there occasionally, this probably it wouldn't raise to a youth activity center in, in my mind. So this is a public pool, and we saw evidence that there was a lot of use sometimes. So I just don't want to pin us in for future, like on an appeal, with regard to, well, we didn't prove regularity, and that's your criteria. Well, it's, it was regular, and it was, it was also sizable, or I, I don't know the magic word, but. It was significant. Um, significant, or, and I don't know if you want to, is today the deadline for this, or? Um, the 150th day is on October 11th, so we do have some time um, if you would like me to make Think those Think about that, or? Um, yeah, absolutely. I just, yeah. You know. Dave, what do you think? Well, you could, uh, obviously you can't take the language out in the quoted section of Waveseer, but in that next paragraph, you could probably remove on a regular basis and then frequently, that I think might broaden the uh, the board's reach, which is what I, I believe the board's indicating. They don't want to... Well, I'm okay it. to leave regular basis. I just w thought we should maybe augment it, that it's frequent. Yeah, like frequency might be the word, or it's actually the quantity to me was that the pictures we showed, or they produced, showed a lot of people using it, so... Or volume. I don't know what the per magic word yeah, we could he said many but many what's, what's more significant than many we could certainly work with Izzy and, and bring back something next week it'll be well within the timeline yeah do you know do you see what my concern is in terms of appeal and right. getting in a, ending up in a box where they say well you didn't prove the criteria you've established it was a regular so, basis yeah right. and so it could be one-offs with large volume 
as opposed yeah. to just a regular. The the other question, I guess, to me is, I kind of adopt a just a what's the what do we say legally clear meaning of the you know the simple meaning youth activity center. Right. Right. So meaning? sure. So I don't know if that's a. I mean, that's where I end up defining this. So. Um, it meets those. It's to me youth. Youth activities occur. Yeah, sure. but it's many. It's not just right. A one off or two people show up every, you know, Saturday or I don't know. Are you, do you are you okay with them looking at that wording and? I think it'd be a good idea. Yeah. Just okay. So I'll because we have the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll make those corrections. Um, Run it by Dave, and then um, can be back in front of the board next week. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Izzy. <clears throat> okay. Next is consideration of uh, <coughs> board signature document number two thousand nineteen dash seven zero zero. Good morning, Commissioners. James Lewis, Property Manager for the County. Um, what you have in front of you today is a request. Um, it's actually a consideration of what is effectively a renewal of an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Lapine and Deschutes County. It was put into place end of October 2014. It expires um, at the end of October of this year. And um, in talking with the Melissa Bethel, the City Manager for the City of Lapine, she's had this conversation with her city council in a work session and they have um, requested a, a effectively a new IGA with the county and with regard to this um, there's no change in the terms from the existing IGA that's attached um, to the uh, IGA that's attached in your your packet today um, it affects 55 properties all of the industrial properties located inside the Lapine city limits um, again some of the terms are the city would through this IGA be responsible for marketing, negotiating, all of the terms, uh, everything to do with those industrial properties. And just a little history, the basis of this was that um, it, if you think about some of the elements in play in Lapine, they conduct all of the land use reviews. Um, they have a specific um, EDCO representative that works in Lapine that works specifically to bring business that, that handles a lot of the marketing and, and negotiations of this property on behalf of the city. Um, so their request going way back to 2014 was that people are in Lapine, it's more efficient and more effective for them to do that. So um, on the back end, um, we've, we've had only one property sale under this IGA. We've had um, four separate option agreements though that have never come to fruition. We have had three different leases. One is a lease option as well under this. Um, so again, only one property sale. Um, the fiscal implications, the revenue of this is split 50-50 between the county and the city. The county is ultimately, as the property owner, is responsible for signing the deeds that convey ownership interest or signing the leases or the option agreements. We collect the money and we distribute 50% of that revenue to the city. Um, <clears throat> with regard to that revenue, those pursuant to the terms when the county obtained the, these industrial lands way back in the 80s is that, that prop, the, those revenues are retained for further development or use to um, spur economic development or development of the industrial lands. So currently um, in, the, in the county right now we have approximately $110,000 that's linked to the sales leases um, from going way back to current. And a recent, the most recent expenditure of dollars um, from that fund goes back to the traffic signal in the pine. That was roughly $200,000 from the county to um, aid in the overall cost. And that was, that was as a result of the, the location of the signal is a prime entrance to the east side industrial lands in the pine. So with that, um, the pr uh, proposal before you is to approve this IGA and be happy to answer any questions that you have. Questions? Uh, no, I'm supportive in support of the City Council and the economic development efforts in the City of Lapine. Uh, I'd like to you know, continue being a partner. Uh, my goal is not to be a, a hindrance in the process, but uh, yeah, just to 
history and the evolution of the land and the incorporation and uh, the relationships, I'm supportive. And I just want to say that Melissa has done a great job in having this presented to us the end of September so that we can actually sign something mm. before it's due. And I really, I really appreciate her timeliness. Um, she's been, um, you know, an effective new city manager. And I want to thank her. Okay. Um, James, you said it affects 55 properties. Is that how many are still in Deschutes County's name? Correct. Those are in Deschutes County's name. There's, there's a lot more industrial properties, but those are what the county owns. And um, do you know how many are owned privately then? or? Uh, you know, I think there, um, man, we did this inventory two years ago. I believe there are 147, give or take. That's just memory banks, total industrial properties that the county um, at one time owned that have been sold off over the years. So fit, we still have 55 properties. So 147 have been sold? Uh, no, 147 total oh, okay. industrial so properies. We, we still retain so about 90 properties. some. Um, are, do you know if any of those are selling, you know, s turning over? You know, um, they're, it's been very slow. I know they are for sale. I've um, been working with um, the new EDCO representative, Scott. Um, it's just very slow sales going on yeah. in the industrial park. It's, you know, it's going to be interesting. I was at the SLED meeting, um, you know, Sun River Lapine Economic Development last week, and now we have a completely different team than we had two years ago or even a year ago with when we had, Cor um, who was the city manager, Corey? Corey, Corey Misley, and then Ryan Culp was the SLED person now we have. Melissa and Scott, so a different team. And I think Scott will be um, a good, uh, will, will work t hard to, to try to get more sales. So it'll be interesting to see what comes of it. And that's who I was meeting with this morning when I said, I got to go. I got a meeting in Bend at 10 o'clock. Oh, good, yeah. yeah. Though he's, he seems real organized and thorough, and yeah. he's really working hard on it. So, okay. Well, I'm supportive of the continuation. Um, I, I do think there'll be some success in the years ahead so okay well let's uh, see with that I'll motion. move board signature of document number 2019-700 an intergovernmental agreement between Deschutes County and the city of Lapine I'll second it okay further comments okay. Commissioner DeBone yes Commissioner Adair yes the chair votes yes thank, thank, you. thank you appreciate it thank you James um Next is consideration of chair signature document 2019-718, a grant agreement with the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission. Hello. Hi. Uh, Holly Harris, program manager with Health Services. Um, I was here a couple of months ago with Judge Crutchley and Lisa Nichols to request um, that we uh, approval to apply for the Criminal Justice Commission Drug Court Grant. We were awarded $241,586 for the biennium, and I'm here today requesting chair signature for that award. That's exciting. Yeah. That's a process to kind of understand, you know, the application, understanding what's going on at the Criminal Justice Commission, uh, supporting uh, uh, the drug court with uh, the state court system in that facility, staffing it. Uh, so, yeah, this is exciting that we were able to receive this grant. I noticed that the only the letter came in on the 10th of September, so, and we have to have it signed by the 27th. <laughs> I'm like, well, timely. Exactly. They don't give us much time. <laughs> no, um, I actually I love the program, and I've been to the graduation. But I'm wondering, um, in the letter, it says it, it usually lasts from 12 to 18 months. But what is what is the um, history uh, in Deschutes County? Because the one I went to, they, some of them had been there quite a while yes. before they graduated. Yeah, and I mean, you know, and that's okay. Yeah, it varies. I mean, so, you know, it's it's a very uh, robust program that people have to follow. So um, not everyone can get it done in the 12 to 18 months that um, is typical. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say on average, it's probably about 18 months. 18 months yeah. is probably yeah. average. Okay. I know some one of the people had a harder time graduating. Yes. So, But they stuck with it. They and did. They did it. And, and if they can stick with it, the, the research really shows that it's very effective for long-term recidivism rates. So I think what are we limited to like 27 uh, maximum in that program or something? I mean, sorry, I I was hoping Lisa Nichols would be here with me. She knows the ins and outs of that right. program. Um, but uh, they do have a limited capacity. Just um, in terms of, I mean, the staff the staffing for this program is pretty minimal. Right. Um, and so the the treatment providers can only take so many. The coordinator can only manage so many. So and, and it's so intense that they there's just so much follow up and uh, coordination of care required that you really can't get the group too big. I know. Well, I, uh, maybe in another two years, though, 
you know, we'll be able to expand that program a bit. That would be wonderful. You know, to keep, um, you know, keep families together. I think that's yep. one Absolutely. of the critical things. It's, um, you know, when you see our school scores again, you think, oh my gosh, kids need to be with their family. Exactly. So thank you for, for bringing this. Thanks for your support. Kind of following up on what Commissioner Dare was um, mentioning. So 27 total, um, but what is the thing that lengthens out? They have to go to a certain number of classes or what is it, or a certain perf they do. performance? That they yes, they have different levels. They have, uh, you know, so at the beginning, they have lots, of, they actually can't even work during level one because there's so much required of them. They need to go to so many classes per day um, with treatment providers, with um, meeting with the coordinator, working on, you know, their sobriety. Um, and so then they move, as they kind of graduate through the different levels, um, it gets less and less. And then by the end, you're really only maybe seeing, maybe not even seeing a therapist anymore. They may actually be in remission at that point and not needing therapy, but are still accountable to the court um, for certain requirements. Someone commented that they wouldn't have to make that phone call, that daily phone call. Yep. yep. <laughs> what will they do without that phone call? So, <laughs> it was great. So which, which way is the phone call? They have to call and check in with the system. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's part of their requirements. So, you know, it was it was amazing because both of the parties did have, um, you know, small children. Yes. And that's that's critical. I encourage you, if you haven't been to a graduation, to attend one. They're really, really interesting. Well, remember, we were Monday set to do one. Soon. We were set to go to one, and then it was the, that was the day the courthouse was shut. Oh, right. <laughs> and I haven't been back. but I went to the one because it was the next week, so I got to go to that one. And is it once a month? Um, it, I don't know if it's every month. It depends on when somebody's graduating. Somebody's graduating. So, yeah, so it, it varies. Check with yes, but we can make sure you get included on it. Yeah, I'd like month. to go to one because okay. we had the discussion about it uh, in front of us, and then we had it at Lipsic also, right. so I'd be interested. Um, well, it's more of a conflict with our Monday afternoon meeting So, because we get the invitations. We just got to make sure we don't schedule ourselves over yeah. a meeting. Yes, that bit is a bit of a problem. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> I've been trying to do that also. But yeah. the room was full. Every seat was taken. Everyone was against the wall. I mean, the support for these people was, um, it was overwhelming. It and you just feel so good that, you know, they they have made a, a better choice for their for themselves and their family. And uh, is the amount of money that we were awarded the amount of money that we sought? Unfortunately not. <laughs> so we they changed the funding formula this year, and they didn't have a cap on what you could ask for, so we actually asked for what um, would have provided all of the services that we wanted. Uh, we asked for 516,452. Um, we were only award we were very disappointed um, in the reduction. Um, there was reductions across the state. Um, and so, but thankfully with our probation and parole partners, our sheriff's office, they were able to fill some of the gaps um, so that we could at least have our treatment providers still continuing to provide the level of service that we expect. Um, and uh, and so we, we came together as a group and found a way to continue the program. It, you know, And I don't have Lisa here with me, but there was some pieces that the Criminal Justice Commission wouldn't fund, and it was part of some parenting classes, I believe, and things like that, which was did make any sense since this is a family drug court program, but um, we are finding ways to overcome that. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a big reduction, and it happened um, pretty systematically across the state for reductions. And I do know that they are wanting, the Criminal Justice Commission has historically just funded drug courts, and I think they're looking for ways for um, other entities to help fund those, those projects going Lost forward. Cost-containment. Cost-containment. <laughs> It's just it's so interesting because last week we were dealing with an, a program that was expanding because they got more money right. than they thought. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's it's really interesting as we deal with the state monies um, because there seem to be choices made that you know where they one program goes up and the other one goes down. And, True. Yeah. Well, it is interesting that um, Rob Bovet from OAC ALC is on it, and then Wally Hicks. So I was thinking like maybe I would call a couple of them just to say we love our program and we really would like to see more funding in the future. Be wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Okay. Any other questions? Let's seek a motion then support of this. Um, I move we have chair's signature for document number 2019-718, the grant agreement with the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission. I'll second it. Okay, Commissioner Dare? Yes. Commissioner DeBone? Yes. Chair votes yes. Yeah, that's terrible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Yep. Thank you, Holly.
Let's see, I think we have a couple more things that we're going to do the letter um, with for OLCC. Okay, you want to join us? Yep, you're next. Good morning, Commissioners. Excuse me. Uh, Tanya Saltzman is here. Um, it is not, uh, your letter is not in your packet because. Um, but you sent it to us yesterday. Correct. That is correct. I have paper copies that I. It, yes, in absolutely. I, I, I printed one out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. So did you end up changing some things then from uh, when we met the other day, or is this the same? Um, besides the date, and no. Okay. The, it is largely, it is intact, completely intact from when I, um, when staff came to the board on Monday. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I'm here to request signature on this document to send to OLCC. So um, I had a couple just word questions, or three, I guess. One is um, in the middle of the second paragraph, there's a f clause that says it remains our position and that it are, that any applicant received local land use approval is considered an existing, et cetera, et cetera. Why don't we just, why don't we just say it is our position? I mean, as opposed to it remains it like they knew to begin with or why, how do they know it remains? That's addressing kind of that there was previous correspondence with OLCC and just saying, you know, we are reiterating. But this is a letter from the commissioners. So I was thinking, uh, you know, it's there. this is us weighing it. Before the, you staffs weighed in, um, we could say, you know, we, we agree with the staff that it is our position. But it just seems remains is a little bit, it's weaker to me. Um, then the sentence above that, I wonder about using the word, you say thereby only addresses local land use permits, um, or the form, what about adding the word future local land use permits? Because that's, it, we're making the point it's just the land use permits, but it's also future oriented. It's not all local. Right. Um, I think the purpose of, and that's completely doable, I think our intent in writing that sentence was just the separation of local land use permits from state level. That would yeah. be a distinction rather than the temporal aspect of it. But we can certainly make Good that point. change. Good point, yeah. I don't, these are just ideas. Yeah, of course. And then the last one was that the last sentence isn't, um, what's an awkward sentence? It seems like it just said, should just say, should not preclude, preclude these applicants from moving forward as, nor, as opposed to nor should. This should be ordinance number 2019. I can recast that, certainly. Should, should not preclude. Since it's our letter, that just seemed like an odd. I don't, it's not bad, but. So it could read um, ordinance number 2019-014 uh, should not preclude. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That just seems like it's better. Sure. Do you have any questions or? I might even drop the last sentence uh, because that's just telling somebody else to do something or whatever. I mean, it's just. Dropping the last sentence would be a would be fine with me. I mean, because well, that is what we're advocate. doing, though. Is we're, that's the goal of the letter. Is I see what you're saying, but it, we are. But we are, are we advocating them for them to license the facilities, or just to uh, respect the fact that we see a clear line. We go through a process. We give an approval, and it's up to them to take it from there. Um, and and the last sentence says. Your job is to take it from there, but it's just kind of outside of the intention of the, the letter as I see it. But just an yeah, idea. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Mr. Chair, what do you think? Oh, well, I would leave um, the last sentence in as um, adjusted just now. So when you say, just to reiterate it, because we're definitely on different sides of this battle, and I just think we should be extremely clear. I like um, this first change you gave where you said is our, in the second paragraph, it is our, I think that's, you mm -hmm. know, you, I think that just makes a little more sense. Absolutely. So I agree with those. And I wasn't quite sure about your second one, if that oh, was just a change or not. I was adding the word future local, but it it, it's, it is true. It, I think it reads right it correctly as it's written. It is okay. Yeah, it's not. It's the fact that it's local. Yeah. A local versus state. Yeah. 
Anyway. It's not temporal. Is there anything else that came up when you're... Um, when we talked about this Monday, I guess. From I wondered how long this was going to take because when we heard that decision originally, that Monday night at 9.30 after the Terrebonne meeting, I read the email from Nick that, oh my gosh, they're saying no. I believe, isn't that when it first, we were first made aware that they were gonna have a different decision with how we as commissioners had made our original local decision. So um, this is good. It's, I think this has been a month, right? Because that meeting was on the 26th of August. So a month later, we're actually technically responding to OLCC. Right. And in well, the staff is engaged with oh, back know. and forth, and so now we're weighing in. And, yeah. Um, now, the other question, um, you know, I, I don't know how hard we're going to work on this or have to work on this, but, you know, we met with the commissioners, and so it wouldn't bother me to write the commissioners saying at, at some point, you know, the OLCC commissioners, when we, you know, they were on their listening tour, they wanted to listen to us. So if we needed to do a letter to them saying we had a concern about interpretation by the staff, it's just, you know. Seeing the commissioners. Maybe. Right. Isn't it? So I, Hugh Palsik did reach out to me and did he? basically he's, he took the position of, or, you know, he asked, yeah, yeah. he asked, was, was this our intention to shut it all down? Or, and, I, and I said, well, we need to have that conversation because my thought was we had talked about, well, there's going to be a subset that have land use approval that are in the system. Remember, that was just the conversations we were having. But we didn't clarify specifically that if we would intend on, if our OLCC gave us the opportunity, mm -hmm. and we didn't know we'd be in it. But he did call me, and I said, yeah, we're going to have this conversation. So he was engaged. He wanted to know. I wonder if he'd heard about it from... He, they had they had the discussion at one of their meetings because he called me in the evening last week after a I remember OLCC he was meeting. Email yeah, or something about it. Well, I think we ought to be thinking about what our next step is if they don't just write back and say we agree. Okay. Well, I support CC in the board. Yeah, could you CC the board on the letter? I think the commission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. I think that was an excellent idea. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I can make these revisions and bring it back for six. You don't need to make it a carbon copy, just a cop. The CC terminology, yeah. There's no carbon in it. I that. know, exactly. Oh, yes. You couldn't use like carbon. C. <laughs> so in terms of getting it signed and out, why don't you just get it done and we'll get it signed today. Or, yeah. you know, we're around. We got another meeting and, um, at 12.30 till 1.45 so, or whatever. So if you yeah. can get it done, get it to Sharon and we'll see if we can get it signed today. Well, Perfect. So I'll move approval as the oh, yeah. with the proposed letter. Okay. And I'll second it. Okay. Uh, any further comments? Commis Commissioner DeBone? Yes. Commissioner Adair? Yes. And Chair votes yes. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank for you, getting Chair. it done. I wonder if, um, Dave, if we had, we didn't really think about this too much when we were doing the ordinance. I mean, we, we, I wonder if we would have worded the ordinance differently if, We'd anticipate that or not. I mean, I, or if that would have helped. Again, as I said the other day, I, I, I struggle to find where OLCC and DOJ yeah, can be coming not. from because what they're impliedly saying is that in passing an ordinance in August of 2019, we somehow invalidated land use approvals that were over a year old. That's yeah, impossible. And, and so I was I just wondering about their, 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 their request. They're not hanging on any law, that's for sure. Yeah, interesting. And I would agree with that statement. I mean, that is where we're at. This is almost a exercise that we couldn't see coming because it didn't seem to make sense. It still doesn't. I would agree. Okay. Um, other items, I um, I guess one thing we wanted to follow up probably was to hear how it went yesterday and your trip to Baker. Uh, uh, one note, the, uh, a little bit of time the vehicle other. is covered in uh, bugs. It's really messy. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I attended Eastern Oregon Counties Association meeting in Baker County. Uh, we met in the morning at the Baker County Courthouse and then also midday at the event center at their fairgrounds with the Forest Service uh, supervisors and deputy director, uh, deputy regional director, whatever her position is, sorry. Um, I took all kinds of notes, big big topic here. One of the things that was really valuable, I was sitting next to uh, Forest Supervisor Tom Montoya from Wallawa Whitman, 
and he put it in perspective. We were just uh, having a lunch break, and we were sitting next to him, and he said, well, the Forest Practices Act from the 70s is where this started. So that, that really put it in perspective, because remember, we're talking about the, on one hand, you know, it's the, the, the public lands, the federal forests in, in Oregon, the timber industry, the spotted owl. Uh, so then there's a 1982 rules-making package that defined what a forest plan is, and then there's like a 2012 up to date, update to that. Um, most There's like 170 f national forests across the country. All forest plans need to be updated, and most of them are more than 15 years old. This is national significance because this is, this is that cycle that's happening after the 70s, the 80s, and uh, the next generation, and now all of them are aging because the litigation process, the you know, federal leadership, the, just every one of these forest plans. So this is the restarting of the whole forest plan project for 170 forests across the country. Uh, because, and there's been a few of them that have gotten across the goal line, so not all of them have been like this, but this is an example of Forest Service working hard to get a forest plan in place, reaching out to other, fe other federal agencies, taking input from um, advocacy groups, local government, and in the end, it was a product that took too long that nobody liked, and it was a, you know, a flop basically. Couldn't get it over the, the uh, goal line. And there's other forests around the country just standing by waiting for this. Yeah, there really are. So that was interesting to think of that perspective. Uh, there's a proposal for the Blues Intergovernmental Council, the BIC, they're calling it already. And that's going to be the, the group that basically says, okay, we're, we're the Intergovernmental Council uh, providing input, feedback, and response, and uh, uh, available for uh, comments as the plan gets redeveloped, this next version of the plan. Uh, so October, it's going to be over in Harney County, uh, Burn, so you'll be driving across for that. But then they're talking Fabulous. about... Fabulous. I'm looking forward to yep, it. Yep. Setting the first two meetings of the Blues Intergovernmental Council, which Eastern Oregon County will be at the table. So we're switching from planning to be officially part of the... BIC. Uh, the, the BIC, which is the, the Forest Plan right. sounding board, to really doing it. And then, so then November is the proposed dates on that, and they're talking about coming here to Central Oregon. Uh, it's, well, that would be great. It's as big as the governor's office in the state of Washington and Oregon, uh, a half a dozen counties in Washington and Idaho, not half a dozen in each, but total half a dozen, confederated tribes, uh, Warm Springs, Umatilla, Burns, Paiute, Nez Perce, Perce, and uh, with, along with BLM, Fish and Wildlife, USDA, Rural Development, Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, and NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, because some of those agencies are the ones that please comment on our forest plan, and then it went in this big, tur it took time, and then it came back, and then there was a disconnect with some plans, so then it just kept, these big circles kept happening, and they never got done with it. So this is the invitation to bring everybody to the table. That's, you know, that's interesting. They've gotten such a wide circle of people. You know, it seemed, it, originally when they started, it seemed like they were trying to get the counties who represent local, you know, elected officials working with the Forest Service directly as the primary people. Well, now it's expanded to everybody, and it, it's going to be interesting to see well, and each whether they're Jones able Association to. Well, and Association and commissioners are the co-conveners with the Forest Service. So right. The forest plan is a product of the Forest Service proper. Because I said, well, right. you know, because I was trying to think of it as three commissioners. When we pass something, we sign a document, the buck stops here, right? And so I was at the table yesterday, and I asked, okay, well, whose product is this? And the, the answer from the uh, deputy supervisor, regional supervisor, she said, the Forest Service. So it's the Forest Service proper is the one that publishes right. this document, and then there's all their layers of management and analysis involved. So was Glenn there yesterday? No, it was his deputy. So he hasn't okay. been at any, anyone's, I think he was at one other besides Band. So yeah, Lisa, uh, right. kind of interesting. Because uh, originally that was the goal, too, was to be sitting with the regional yes. head to working on it. But all I'm saying, Tony, is that they, when the county people started wanting to convene this, it was so they could 
get kind of a local involvement ahead of so many people being involved and now it's ending up being everybody the only ones that aren't in it are the federal representatives and that was um, a decision made the week the meeting before this because there there's so much disagreement between them that 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 would de derail the process but they every other major player is kind of at the table now well and those are kind of mandated players because so we had yeah. that discussion too uh, because uh, Lisa Northrup is the deputy regional forester. She was the one that was there in Glenn Casamas's position. Uh, so uh, it, there was the discussion of, about informed consent uh, 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 of a decision of the, the BIC opposed to a vote, thumbs up or thumbs down, by the people at the BIC meeting. And then there was the step was, well, some of this stuff is just federal law. and. And, you know, commissioners, we understand, okay, well, that's defining the box you're in. So we're not talking about stuff that's not law. We're talking about rules and how it's implemented, stuff that's not black and white law. So we kind of went around on that. So the invitation becomes as big as kind of the players that are there because of statute and law. It's too bad my first cousin isn't still um, in Lisa's job. Wouldn't that, right. Wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> Good. Like, okay, Nancy. Very influential. Well, no, it's very interesting because I think we have 20 different um, forests in Oregon and Washington, and um, our forester just gave me the list of the lumber output for 15 and 16. So now, because the president had signed that bill for 3.8 billion board feet, I'm looking to see if they, in our area, actually increased our um, timber production mm -hmm. and it I've got some of the commissioners getting the numbers for me but it, it doesn't really look like our area had picked up that from what I've looked, found so far well one of the other ideas is uh, forest management remember we've been aggressively suppressing fires for a hundred years we're getting to the uh, fuel and this is uh, ideas around it fuel reduction efforts uh, uh, prescribed burns but also torrification plant going in and John day they're trying they're getting that going uh, the uh, Red Rock biofuels down in uh, Lake, Lake Lake County. Field. So those are not board feet. Those are biomass. You know. So right. I'm just saying there's other ways to measure. Right. I know, but he actually said 3.8 billion board feet, and it hadn't been above 3 billion since um, last year. 3.2 billion, but since 1997. So there should be a significant difference in the numbers, and mm -hmm. you know it'll be yeah. fascinating to see when we see the actual numbers. Yep. Yep. So you're getting a... I'm getting the numbers of board feet, like I've talked to the commissioners from um, Wallow and things, how many board feet are there, they saying in their area that have been picked up to see if anything was happening in Oregon and Washington. Interesting, yeah. Well, you know, it's just like following through. Is, is, is that well, it's actually... It's hard to make it happen, yeah. Right. Is it really happening? To, one thing to order, it's another thing to get, get it done. Right. So, interesting. And do we want to burn it or graze it? So do you think it was worthwhile to go over there? And yeah. Yeah, in fact, I ended up taking an a action item, which is the, the invitations uh, to some of these folks that aren't, haven't been at the table for this, the BIC, the Blues Intergovernmental Council. And so I'm going to be working with uh, Craig Trulock, which is the Mollier super, uh, Superintendent. Yep. Are you correcting my the way I say it? Thank you. No, I did Mel here, isn't it? Uh, no, because I I do I was like I try to say it correctly. Mel here. <laughs> Mel here. Mel it's okay. Here. So we could say Ro because, Rodeo and we yeah, yeah. are <laughs> like my husband. Mel here. But so uh, reaching like, out to the Warm Springs yet. Reservation, so that's in, in Jefferson County, but really they have large land interests over there. I didn't understand that, so <laughs> I took an action item <laughs> yesterday's, which is to connect with the tribal leadership for an invitation. That's great. So I mean, it's valuable because that shows partnership and. Uh, you know, making sure they know we're at the table. And I mentioned that was the goal for the three of us to just make a presence whenever on a rotating basis. Oh, good. good. All right. So that's great if they're going to come back to Ben then. So they're talking, there's a draft letter which is going to be the invitation, the next step. And they're talking about setting the date of uh, um, November 22nd in Portland. I was thinking they set two dates, maybe just that first one. So Friday, November 22nd. Well, he's October. What's that one? Uh, well, I, this is the big, the first one for the Intergovernmental Council, very specifically. So this letter is to go out to the partners that haven't been at the table yet, the big boys, the you know the rest of the group. So it was the letter says Portland, but they discussed doing it in Central Oregon instead. Um, for November. November twenty second, 
and they That's discussed the of, uh, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving yeah. But they said, you know, this is kind of important. We're on a roll. We're acknowledging that it is that week, but yeah. it was well, decided to proceed. People actually fly yeah. here, and you know, so maybe that will help bring it everyone still. in. Yeah. Here. Wow. And the October one is October twenty. It's the last Tuesday. Last one. Okay. I have it on my schedule. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Um, other items? Tom has something. Something, Tom. Uh, you all go first. Or? Okay, well. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I'm media called and asked what's the next step for Terrebonne. And so I'm just, I, that's all I'm doing is laying that out there. Is there anything from the governing body's point of view, I guess, is, is um, you know, because it was an application from ODOT, changed the TSP, there was a motion that didn't, didn't get a second. Uh, is there any other activity that you guys know of on this? Or there were a lot of notes, uh, people thanking us for not doing something, and then there seemed to be some co communications between a couple of the active citizens and ODOT about other ideas. And so I, I'm assuming I there'll notes be some. Thanking for my position also. So good. it's just like that, you know. Well, that's good. Maybe we should find those, out. Yeah. Well, I think that was one of the, the problems. It was unclear where every, where people were locally. So it'd be interesting to know, you know, how many. I think we, I got, um, I don't know, six or seven maybe. So I yeah. actually um, had breakfast yesterday morning in Terrebonne at the Sunspot with um, Robert Townsend. And I asked him if he wanted to drive around with me, and he didn't. But um, I then I went over to the hardware store and everyone talking to people there what what they were thinking and the original the owner of the hardware store was on the advisory he had actually made a suggestion which to me makes a lot of sense where they come down Smith Rock right at 11 you could have a small sign that says if you want to go to 97 you take a right there and you actually do a proper intersection for lower bridge you know like U Avenue where it's very clear, very clean, and people could go down there and go the direction they need to go. But he said he felt like that was something that was simple for the city, and especially if we need to do something with their sewer system before they rip it all up, you know, again. So that was his original suggestion over a year ago. And um, spent a day um, in Salem with the road department. Chris was there talking to us about, you know, roads and signs and, uh, you know, stop signs and everything. But according to some of the letters I've received, they would consider a stop sign. They don't really put a light in right at Smith Rock. But this other idea made a lot of sense. It's, what is it? It's probably a little over half a mile maybe three quarters of a mile from the turn at Smith Rock down to that, um, if that intersection was done on a significant level. So that was, that was fascinating. So in, in the breakfast with Bob Townsend, had he requested that? Yes, he wanted to meet with me. And so I actually, he was going to come to the office and I thought, oh, no, no, let's meet in Terrebonne because yeah, that's go. where yeah. we need to meet. And so I did want to drive around with him and he said, oh, no, we don't need to do that. But I, so I drove around later, and then I was talking to people and, um, you know, getting a feedback from people that actually live in Terrebonne. So. so. So I think in answer to your question about other things going on, I think my impression is there's some discussion between ODOT and some of the local people there about ideas, but it's just based on some emails I saw the week after we made yeah, the decision. Yeah, and so I'm just acknowledging know. that, you know, we had a – I mean, I, so then it puts us in a spot where is, you know, what is the, what's the logistics of this application? I don't know, you know, as in there was an, a request to change the TSP. Yeah, maybe you can help with that. ODOT asked uh, the Community Development Department about the status of the application, and we, we stated two things. One is the application has not been withdrawn, yeah. so it's still active, and the board hasn't definitively um, voted to to deny it. So it's... It's still alive. It's just that no further actions are, have been scheduled uh, before the board. And I'm not involved in any of the conversations that Chair Henderson just mentioned, but I, I'm aware that ODOT is having a number of conversations. I can confirm that they are having conver conversations with uh, local residents, local businesses, and other entities. Um, but Chris would be certainly the best person to, to discuss that with separately. 
other updates from you, um, Air? Yesterday, we actually had the first official meeting regarding the Veterans Court. And though our um, judges are, you know, so overwhelmed, they aren't going to be, they were not part of that conversation, but there are a lot of things that can be done in order to help with the Veterans Court. Um, Amanda from the VA, the federal VA office, not with the health care, um, was there, um, Representative Health, Shane, um, Sheriff Nelson was there, um, DA Hummel, and then Kathleen, the woman who's actually doing the research, pulling together what we can do. And it is, um, it's extremely positive. Somebody currently has, I think it's, unfortunately, it's like their third um, case as a veteran. And if they would have had the help initially, probably they wouldn't have had the third case. You know, a lot of people don't really want to say they're a veteran, and they're really working on pulling the veterans out and what is it, what is it they can do in order to um, help them, get them the help they need, and not make them part of the, um, you know, the jail system. So it was a really good meeting. We're going to meet again, and she's coming up with a draft proposal of what it is we can do without having the court mm -hmm. part of it till we get our judge. Is there? But it, yeah, it, it is like it's a lot of positive things. So it's it's a start. Good. Anything? Any other meetings you want to report on? Um, I think that was my day yesterday. So I, um, one thing, I, I am going to the LCDC meeting tomorrow. Um, they, I'm going to probably stay from the, all morning because it's about housing generally. There's a lot of discussion by the, by the board about stuff. So I, I thought it would be interesting to, while I'm there to stay and listen to what, kind of what they talk about and how they talk about it so I'll be able to report something back. Um, and I'll probably just give a shorter presentation. I think I'm going to focus on the issue of the housing goal being as important as others, and then uh, follow up on our letter that we sent, um, basically reiterating some of that, and um, kind of advocate for keeping that in their work plan. Um, but a lot of what they're doing tomorrow is about how they're going to move, you know, 2000 bill House Bill 2001, House Bill 2003, talking about that. So it's, you know, all the things that um, we heard that they were have taken over the, the goals, so should know more by Monday. All right, Tom, additional things? Uh, yeah, a couple quick things, commissioners. Uh, I asked Nick to stay on, too. Um, last week, uh, Nick and I met with uh, uh, Ben City Manager uh, Eric King and Carolyn e Egan, their economic development director, about the Bend Airport. Uh, as we've had several discussions, and it came up during our joint meeting, if you recall, there's some um, actions uh, that need to be taken at the airport and uh, it's been a, a little bit piecemeal so far the conversations that we've had so we thought the, the four of us kind of thought it would be a good idea to you know have a, a series of discussions with the Commission on um, just kind of the, the history and background of the Bend Airport the um, current trends uh, going on right there what's there now could include a tour, so we've kind of we've we've laid out a series of meetings. We wanted to give you a heads up about that um, uh, beginning next Wednesday on the second, uh, where we'll give provide you know with the city's help, Carolyn will be there some background on you know just kind of the the current regulatory framework, the current business environment, and some of the land use issues associated with the airport. And at that meeting, we'll also lay out sort of a, a schedule. Um, Wanted to just kind of give you a heads up on that. Um, Nick, feel free to jump in on on um, uh, anything I missed or you know the perspective from a from CDD or the land use side of things. That's that's exactly right, Carolyn and I have been coordinating this morning um, to prepare for her presentation. Really, she's going to lead it, and we'll be there for more for Q and A next week on the second. And then it, that's exactly right. Then we'll schedule a follow up meeting. They're they're more than happy to take the commissioners on a tour of the airport. They've even discussed an air tour of, of the airport and area, potentially. Um, they're going to extend those um, opportunities for the board in October. And then we would have a final meeting um, with the commissioners. This would just be us with staff and in close coordination with legal for the board to decide how you would like for um, us to coordinate with the city on uh, processing their application to update their, the, their uh, master plan for the airport. Would you like it to be legislative, which means 
there's a lot more discussion and dis and um, interactions, and there's not the bias, and there's a lot, you know the ex parte those kinds of issues. There's always bias, but not the ex parte um, conversations. Or would you like it for it to be a quasi judicial, which is a lot tighter framework? Um, and we believe that the board of commissioners has the authority to to decide which which avenue, which way to to process it. So once you have the overview and then a tour, then we'll touch base with you on how you would like for us to to work with the city going forward, so that you can. Um, participate directly in that discussion. Okay. Are we hearing anything from the uh, people that live out around the Bend Airport currently? Um, we have a lot of interactions with them on, on various topics, of course, with CDD on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. With these three meetings, they wouldn't be involved in that, but of course, through the entire um, airport master plan update, they will certainly be involved. And that would be, whether it's legislative or quasi-judicial, absolutely, we will include them in that process from start to finish yeah I know there's incredible there potential for what can happen out there exactly so yeah that'll be very important there's some people that may not you know be thrilled as, yeah uh, thrilled with it because I, they're looking at expansion yeah. things which always affects the neighbors and that will be part of what they discuss next week is just part of the their conceptual plans at this point. I know they're doing some survey marking out there because I heard from someone who works out there and they were thrilled yeah. so and James Lewis will also need to be involved because the county's also a property owner. Right. Um, so yeah, that would be one thing that'd be yeah. interesting because I don't have any. I know we own property. The county owns property out there, but I don't know where it is. Yeah. Or I know where it is, but not kind of a map of it. So, okay. Speaking of that, um, one of the issues that Sharon had asked about was the um, what was it, the state of the city that oh, was conflicting conflict. conflicting with uh, our joint meeting with Lapine. Is that what it was, State of the City, with uh, the Ben Chamber? Mm -hmm. So did did you want did anybody want to go to that as part of the and reset the the Lapine meeting or it must be a Tuesday meeting with Lapine. I wonder why we're not doing it on a Wednesday. Isn't that when they isn't that when the Lapine usually meets? I think so. It must be a work hmm? session day or a regular meeting. I wonder why we have it on a Tuesday with them. I hadn't put the uh, Ben Chamber event on my schedule, so I mean, I'd kind of lean towards following through with Lapine at this point. I'd like, well, to, I'd like to see the city council. I, mean, I, I kind of see him individually, but not as a group usually. Well, I, I'm I'm in favor of having the meeting, and I even I wonder why it isn't on a Wednesday. I wonder if we could find that out if they have a meeting on Wednesday, and we could mm. we do it as yeah, part of that the next day. Maybe it's a. Yeah, find out if it's a special session and maybe just add it. To the, yeah, to do you want to do you want to look into yeah, that for us? Okay, and then do we have a meeting set with Redmond yet? Uh, we have a tentative date uh, for Redmond as well as Sisters. Um, uh, the Sisters is the twenty second, I believe, of October, and Redmond is the first or second week in November. Um, so I'll be at Lapine is coming up, and we've got a. Uh, kind of a draft, uh, putting together a draft agenda. We wanted to check with you and see if there's any specific um, items that you're interested in hearing about from the city. Uh, kind of the, the standard thing is just sort of the latest development trends, new projects, new, um, you know, kind of permit statistics and, you know, any other thing going on there. But if there's anything specific that you'd like to hear about, we can certainly give uh, them a heads up to put it on the agenda. But we just uh, signed the agreement for the land, so just kind of laying that out there, making sure we're all kind of acknowledge just an agenda item acknowledging that, uh, and the loan we just did the other day. So you know, they're just kind of those action items we can all just acknowledge and then check off. I'd like to see that um, sled update from Scott Orman. Uh, you know, he'll he's very energetic and uh, getting up to speed real quick. So pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And, and if there's any further, um, what I heard at SLED was that the, the new project the, is called the Reserve, I think. Russell's project would be interesting to hear if there's any progress on that, because that's a city Land permit, Land. yeah. So there seems to, and then there, as you mentioned, there was something else going on, some expansion. When I was down there the other day for SLED, I drove around to look at 
the industrial lots, and there's some project, I don't know if that's the one you're talking about, that there's something going in, some foundations and excavation work. There's little right sections up. of sidewalk going in, which is our uh, land use requirement that you put a sidewalk in when you get your approval. So there's, that tells you something's really happening because there's little sections yeah. of sidewalk going in, unconnected, which is a shame. But yeah, but yeah I don't know the specific things in which buildings. Yeah. Other things, Tom? Uh, just one other thing. Um, uh, Crook County, I know uh, Judge Crawford reached out to, um, I know he spoke to both uh, Tony and Patty, I'm not sure if you. Yeah, he talked to me too, so. So uh, I'm still fact-finding, uh, actually a little bit about what's going on. I understand there's some um, issues with their uh, behavioral health contractor uh, and the states involved, so they've reached out now in two different areas of uh, for help uh, in providing behavioral health services. The one, if you recall, a week or so ago had to do with uh, crisis services, and it was more of a, a request to be their backup. The one yesterday was much more immediate, mm -hmm. uh, involving their wraparound services and two specific clients. So um, part of the fact-finding that, that we're still kind of developing is, and I see Holly Harris is back joining us, who may be able to add, add to the discussion, but um, is uh, how it affects our capacity, our ability to um, deliver services to our own population here. So uh, I'm not sure if there's anything specific that was asked uh, by Judge Crawford or if we, you know, um, this is the right time to talk about that or if, uh, if you have any general thoughts or direction as we continue to sort of get a handle on uh, what the uh, request is and may be uh, in the coming days and weeks. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Deschutes County's operation and Crook County operation different scale, so he definitely uh, reached out you know, to me, and it sounds like to each of us. Uh, and I've kind of thought of it more of a, as a, a courtesy to make sure we understand. That's why I left you a message right away about conversations happening. So, uh, you know, picking up a case or two cases that you know, if that was a choice by whoever, I mean, I didn't authorize it on a phone call. It's just kind of what I'm saying here, so that wasn't my intention. Uh, but communicating in their time of need is the important priority at this point. Uh, yeah, we need to know more facts about what it looks like because if they have a, a whole provider system that's not going to be there or if they're just understaffed by one or two people, I'm not sure the scope and scale of what's going on right now. My, my I don't know how much. Yeah, May as well put on the mic if we're joining us. Yep. It's not just one or two uh, staff people. Yeah. So I, and I yeah. and I didn't get into that on the phone yep. call. And so. Do you want to give me what? Are you coming back, or do you want to give me what you had? Did you have that stuff you brought for me? The letter. Uh, the other letter from the thousand friends. Yeah, I'll grab it. Oh, okay. It okay. 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 Sorry, I didn't want to. Excuse me for interrupting. I was. Um, <laughs> Um, so, yeah, it's, it's more than just one or two uh, staff shortages over there. So I, um, I don't know the extent of it. They haven't been in communication with us about that. But they have. They did ask us for a plan for crisis coverage should they not be able to provide crisis coverage. And we can't absorb their crisis system um, with our current staffing levels without some sort of additional funding or staff or something yeah. from them. Um, but we did offer them a, a pool of people that do on-call coverage for us for a crisis when we're short-staffed, and we offered them access to that pool if they paid them. Um, and then for the, recently for these two child cases, they um, felt like weren't getting the level of service they needed in Crook County, so they asked us to take on those two cases. I think our concern going forward, well, we can – We'll, um, we'll try and manage these two cases. We're going to wait and see kind of what the ask is. But I think the concern is what's, what's the next ask yeah. and how extensive is it going to be and what's our... I don't have any more information. Yeah. So, so um, I think it was your email, Tom, saying about the two people. Yeah, and the, I mean, I'm fine with that in terms of just an immediate need because we, you know, we hold ourselves out as being able to do it. I, I, but I do... Maybe we should have it as a work session next week as to what they're really wanting. Because originally, the request was a couple of weeks ago was, would we be a backstop? Or now it seems like it's gone into. But I don't really. That didn't seem like they were clear, based on my communication with Judge Crawford. They weren't clear of what they needed, larger picture. But he was th he was talking about it. So okay. maybe we should have more clarity on what it is they really want. I I didn't say yeah we're interested in 
becoming the mm -hmm. crisis center, I, but it would be hard to turn down a couple of requests, specific requests, I guess, I, is my thought. So. Yeah, no, that makes sense. We'll, we'll try and round up the picture, learn as much as we can, and bring back some specific uh, areas where we could use some policy direction from. from the do, do they have a health, um, behavioral health director or uh, the staff as well? Uh, yes, yeah, so they're set up as uh, unique, uh, more unique than ours. They have, you know, Lutheran as a private entity that's there, and so they're, they're, they're higher up people or not necessarily in Crook County. Um, their behavioral health, their CMHP director is out on um, extended medical leave, so they don't really have anyone that we can kind of communicate with right now. that works for Crook County that's... Well, Lutheran is their, their so They CMHP. don't have somebody that you can talk to that's on the payroll for, for the I'm county. saying, as opposed to so that that person could be talking because it seems like judge Crawford will be the one talking to you about it that's so that he's generally been the one that's been making the request I do know that they have um, and I'm sorry I'm spacing on his name but the uh, the individual they have consulting um, that's uh, they have a consultant that's helping them trying to navigate what they're going to do about the situation I think he used to be the director at health services years ago right oh yes, yes. sorry I can't think of his name right now <laughs> Yes, Gary Smith, and so he's helping, um, and he actually reached out to us to let us know that some of these requests were going to be coming our way, so he's sort of been our li little liaison at this point. Well, a good time for us to talk about it would be Monday, if we can, if they can get organized by then, and as to what they're looking at, if they're you know, they may be still trying to decide things, so they may not be able to say much. She had said something to me on Saturday when I saw him, um, um, Judge Crawford had, and so then yesterday afternoon when he called me, I was thinking he was at the, um, what Edco had their uh, Crook County Day. Yeah. But he said, oh no, I've got this other issue that I'm, you know, in the middle of. Yeah. So it does sound like. We need clarification. We do, and I think the challenge, particularly for um, their their specific requests for wraparound, even with these two cases, it puts us in a challenging position because wraparound has fidelity metrics around it, and they have, so they can only take so many kids, and we're actually already at capacity for our fidelity for that program. So taking on even the two um, puts us outside of our fidelity measures. Um, but we'll we will help support them the best we can. And um, so since it sounds like you'll be there may be on Monday. May we get have an update on the stabilization center also? Okay. Um, since we're, yeah. <laughs> since you're going to be there with yeah. You. Actually, Lee, Lee was planning that working with health services for next week. So Monday be a good time. Um, so yes, we good. would love to hear the update. <laughs> Great. I'll be happy. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Other things. I had a Rick. request for executive session under uh, labor negotiations. This is follow up to Monday's discussion in executive session. Okay. And I've got feedback on that, so do we want to do that next? And is there any other executive sessions? Any world? Okay, yeah, I, I got feedback. I did what I was supposed to do. <laughs> okay, um, so we can do that here, can't we? We just now need to um, turn off the cameras and okay. Correct. Okay. Or you could recess upstairs. Is the Allen room open? Well, I mean we're. Can't we just? It doesn't seem as like it take very long, so we'll um, adjourn for today, or or we will recess and reconvene an executive session.